to make a, a considerable attempt to share my screen here. So this is the delightful slideshow that Corey was kind enough to uh, put together here. Um, if you guys have questions, I would actually, I would recommend putting them in the chat and then we will sort of go over them maybe at the end in the event that your question is answered during the course of the presentation. Um, but I don't want to lose track of anyone. So if you need to butt in, go for it. <laughs> it's all right. Um, I just want to be able to kind of do the overview and then open the floor to any questions, comments, wisecracks, concerns, anything like that. All right. Um, so we're apparently in unit 15, uh, composite yeah. materials. Uh, what were you saying, Corey? Yeah, the units come fast. Unit 15 is where I think we are by sort of keeping track. Ish, yes. Um, okay, so we're going to be going over general theory, a few examples, many of which will be very familiar to you because you have been out in the world, um, and then a couple different ways to make composites. Um, I will stress with any and all mold making and casting adjacent things, including this, starting out with a very simple basic project is absolutely the way to go um, when you're learning because there's a lot of detail that doesn't come up until it comes up and the first thing you want to do is get um, acquainted with the material and just kind of get over the hump of trying it the first time okay um so we're going to start with the theory um materials have properties this is, it on the slide. <laughs> this is the graph slide that I'm gonna that I'm gonna talk about. Yes. Um, so it's one of the cool things about the science of materials that that you can really nerd out hard. There's entire college, entire like schools of material science. You can get degrees in it. Um, and so that graph in the top right is talking about how some materials are really brittle. They'll take a lot of stress and then they snap. So think about like a carbide end mill is that blue vertical line. A strong material that won't stretch very much is the is the sort of tan one. The green one will stretch and then deform. Think of like aluminum or or steel will do that. And then plastic materials will just bend and bend and bend and bend and bend like a rubber band. They'll just go, 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 go until they snap. Um, different materials have these different properties. The the graph to the bottom right sort of puts the maximum service temperature and strength like all these properties are things that we just sort of inherently think about at Make Haven. We're rarely doing a full material analysis to like understand all the ins and outs of those, but it's it's kind of cool. That graph I really like because it's sort of outlining different strengths of different types of wood. Like if you're reading through those, it talks about oak and MDF and paper, pine, balsa wood. Like balsa wood is super light, it's for model building, but it's also got an unbelievably high tensile strength relative to its like crushing strength. So there's some really cool things about it. Um, and learning all those details about your materials is really useful. And in my mind, like the sciencey part of this entire unit is that there's a lot of cases in the world where you get much higher benefit from bringing in the best parts of multiple materials into one singular composite material. And so that's, that's the core of what we're gonna be looking at today uh, from the sciencey perspective. Brilliant, yes. Um... And one of the things that um, is also pretty consistent with um, this type of work is that you decide what you want to do and then you back it off from there. And sometimes there's one material that will be great for everything you need it to do. And sometimes taking the properties of two different ones and combining them is the best way to go. So with that being said, I love this slide. Um, some mashups are good, others are questionable. You can mix all sorts of different things and you get various results. Um, but the uh, the important thing is that you just, you know, try stuff out, see if you like it and move on. You know, maybe you get Hulk fiction, maybe you get snakes on a plane. I'll leave it to you guys to decide which one's better. <laughs> um, so structural composites, I feel like this is another one that Corey may want to elaborate on because it's his jam. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, the composites are generally used broadly because you get a ton of access to really good properties of different things. And so this is commonly used all around us. The example of the steel bridge there is, is a good case. You've got all of that structure up above the bridge and all of those members are generally going to be in tension where there's a pulling force on them. The Q bridge or the Pearl Harbor Memorial Bridge, whatever you want to call that, that bridge in the top right over the New Haven, uh, the Quinnipiac River, that bridge has got those big concrete pylons and then large steel cables coming down. The concrete is then held in compression and concrete is really good at holding, at holding up big heavy loads in a compression force, but it's really bad if you try and pull it apart. It'll actually come apart pretty easily if you're pulling at it. And so by designing the bridge just like that, you get the best balance of pull and push force so that the pylons are holding all the weight of the bridge and the cables are holding everything in tension so that it, it balances out the two strengths. There are some really interesting exceptions to that though. Some of the oldest things that people have built uh, were built by ancient Romans or other fantastic ancient architects where they weren't as good at the metalworking part. It turns out in general, concrete and stone is good at compression and metal is good at tension. Um, and so when we were building things pre-metal, like before you put rebar in your concrete, we'd build these big fancy stone arches. And, and it wasn't a decorative uh, structure. You didn't build the arch because you wanted to or you thought it looked nice. The arch actually does a fantastic job of distributing forces so that they're always in compression. So if you're walking across that bridge, your, your weight is always pressed down across something and you're compressing that force into the other pieces. That is the core structure that let um, bridges like that crazy thing be built or the aqueducts in ancient Rome, the Parthenon, the Colosseum, all those like iconic ginormous buildings. They're all built in such a way that they were only compressive forces in the engineering. There's like, there's some people who get really nerded out about the perfect blend of concrete mix to get it just right. And there's a little bit of stuff to that, but the real secret sauce to the ancient Roman architecture was that it was almost exclusively in a compressive force. Um, the other thing that really helped is that it was just huge. And so having massive structures really helps weigh things down, also keeping it in compression rather than having it sort of be pulled or, or moved around by the wind or any sort of a, a shearing force. But these like combinations are really helpful. The all stone construction is pretty limiting. And so we're used to bridges that are closer to that one that's, that's wood and steel. Uh, at least I grew up where there were bridges like that every so often when you're driving around because they're pretty light to put in place, but the, the decking is pretty strong for compression. And, and then all of that overstructure is good at tension. And then the Q bridge is, is sort of the hallmark of a modern bridge structure, right? Where you've got the balance of those two things so that you're optimizing your ability to have a bridge covering a huge area and minimizing the amount of material that it takes. Yeah, it is truly magical. Yeah, yeah. it really just floats mm -hmm. over the river. All right, so, oops, sorry. Um, there are a plethora of different um ways to go about all these like infinite combinations of materials but there is um there are a few that crop up again and again simply because they work really well um and the ones here that we have listed we've got um composites reinforced by particles meaning that there is something like it's mixed in to the goo usually like frequently this is a resin um, composites reinforced by chopped strands, where that is free, free floating, loose, um, long fibers, not like a powder or something like that. It's a longer fiber, but they're not um, in a like a, a cloth format. Uh, and unidirectional composites, which is where you have the, the um, there there is some sort of like a strand like. Um, component that is there to give tensile strength to something that might be more brittle like an epoxy or I suppose actually like rebar and concrete is an example of this as well where it's just going in one where the thing that gives it the tensile strength is only going in one direction so um 
you know, it doesn't necessarily always have to be one way or the other, but frequently they'll only kind of invest in uh, shoring up something like in construction, for instance, when like where there's a need, like they wouldn't, you know, put rebars in all directions if they only need it going in one way for the, the needs of the structure for strength. Um, laminates, a favorite of mine, where you're, you know, just kind of sandwiching like plywood, you know, you're sandwiching different layers of things together. Um, fabric reinforced plastics, which is really cool. <laughs> we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, this is where a lot of, uh, you know, things like body armor and parts to vehicles and stuff like that, you can get very thin, but very strong parts by combining um, resins and fabrics. Um, and then honeycomb composite structure. That one, I will let Corey talk about a little because I'm not precisely certain what the real world applications of it are. <laughs> Oh, are we that about is corrugated cardboard, or what do we? Oh, it's um, I don't know if you've ever destroyed an IKEA desk, which is cathartic, by the way. But um, okay. inside of an IKEA desk, they have it's a hardy, it's a hardboard ah. topper and bottom, and then it's a honeycomb cardboard in between. Because right. in those IKEA desks that are exceptionally light, like really, you the all of the stress and strain of that board to keep it flat is in the top and bottom surface the middle is almost useless. So they just fill it in with cardboard so that the any strain the top feels, it can transfer down to the bottom, but it really isn't needed to have all that strength. Um, and so you get some like, just for sheerly structural pieces when you're not varying materials too much, that honeycomb cardboard is super useful for that, which is over there on the left side, the NASA Lewis Research Center. That's ah, okay. really, that's super good. And then plywood, like the, the same thickness of plywood and solid wood the plywood is significantly stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and so that sort, which is just one of the D laminates where you have cross members, just by taking the grain and laying them perpendicular to each other, you get much higher strength from those. And those are sort of the like the bigger scale composites where, where the structural pieces are built in. They're sort of engineered materials on a bigger scale. Um, the thing that's real exciting about composite though is when it gets to, to real tiny. So like the fiber, you can see sort of the wavy fibers in the left. That's totally a fiberglass. Yeah, that thing. And then the fiberglass just below, those are totally some sort of a fiberglass and resin that are put together to make something nice and strong. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't don't underestimate the chop, underestimate the chopped strand. That stuff really adds a lot. I use that for mother molds actually. Um, but yeah, so the, this is stuff like once you start kind of looking for it in the day to day, you know, the course of your day to day life, you're going to start seeing stuff everywhere um, because, you know, it's, it's saying, you know, I need this material to do X. I'm going to take these two other materials and combine them to get the result that I want, because perhaps, you know, each material is only good at what it does. But when put together with something else, you get something dramatically better than each of them. Uh, individually. Uh, all right. And yes, a good point here. Uh, usually there is a liquid component combined with something that is a solid that, um, and then the liquid hardens to create the composite material. That's a fairly, you know, typical thing, you know, like concrete and rebar or fiberglass and, uh, and resin. All right. So on to examples of composite materials. So um, here, Corey's favorite, <laughs> good old concrete and rebar. It's always uh, a winner. Yes. Um, plywood sheets. The, uh, the, the secret to plywood is that the grain goes in alternating directions. So you have the grain going in one direction on one sheet, and then the next one will be large, like almost perpendicular to it. Um, and that adds an immense amount of strength compared to if all of the layers were running in the same direction. Um, fiberglass for auto parts and auto bodies, uh, that's a great example of fibers in um, a resin and you get these beautiful, smooth, very thin, but very, very strong parts. Um, carbon fiber is awesome. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Corey. No, you're good. That was like the hallmark of the first round of like sports cars was mm -hmm. the transition from an all metal body. To these fiberglass bodies so now the same exact engine was carrying a lot less weight so all of a sudden cars became very performant without a huge shift in the actual like internal engineering 
Yeah, and they can be stronger in certain ways than metals. Um, yeah. And and it's it's got a flex to it. It'll pop back into place, whereas a metal will just bend. Um, the another thing that uh, I've seen probably more on like small vehicles, like motorcycles and stuff, but the carbon fiber, um, this is exceptionally strong, and I believe there's also a lot more heat resistance to it, probably. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we're going to be able to do in this class, which is great. Um, you'll also see this with, you know, things like body armor, because it's, you know, anything that needs to be worn, but also needs to protect something squishy like a person. Um, you know, this is a great, a great way to do that because the amount of resin used is relatively small. Um, it's just enough to kind of impregnate the, uh, the cloth. So it doesn't weigh much, but it's very, very strong. Um, modern airplane bodies, which is cool. I love this picture down at the bottom. That is an oven for airplane bodies. Who knew? Um, the good old. Yeah, it's guy. really one of the one of the airplane companies had like a whole thing of big metal bird was their branding when you're on the plane. I forget which one it was. One of the discount airlines, but it's totally not metal. <laughs> like it's got a composite body that they bake in an oven because it's just it's if it were all metal, it would be too heavy. Yeah, a flightless metal bird. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, paper mache is a, is a super, it's probably one of the first ones all of us are uh, exposed to as children. It's, you know, a hallmark of crafting, but, you know, it's a, a gluey, goopy substance combined with paper, which is fibers, and you get a much stronger end result than you would if either of them um, by themselves. Um, one that's all around us all the time is drywall panel because that's a, a crumbly but highly compressive gypsum with paper to give it tensile strength on either side. Um, engineered that always, yep. That one's always mind blowing that like it's a composite <laughs> material that it literally surrounds us almost all the yeah. time. Every day, all day. Um, engineered hardwood floor. This is an interesting way to show this actually if you guys can see where it's a solid and engineered um one thing another uh, benefit of engineered materials in for instance in this scenario wood natural wood is beautiful it's great but it is kind of a, it's still a living thing it expands and contracts with moisture it has grain that is not straight um, you know, no matter what you do, you're never going to get a perfectly straight natural grain. That's just not the way the world works. Um, and so when you have a situation where like the stability of something is very important, where it can't expand, contract, shrink or warp, anything like that, having an engineered solution will make it very, very stable compared to the natural counterpart. That's kind of a nice benefit. Um, and when you're choosing materials, Sometimes that's something you really need. You need a thing to not move, to not swell, like depending on how tight your tolerances are. Um, casts, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen me doing any of my uh, life casting or other casting in the space, but um, parts of uh, my molds very, very strongly resemble the casts that go on, on broken people parts like, uh, you know, arms and legs. And what it is is plaster mixed with the usually um, burlap bandages of, or cloth bandages of some result or some kind. And they're, they're lightweight and strong enough to protect you while you heal. So that is an, uh, an old school but still in, uh, in use technique. Um, and then bimetallic strips and thermostats. I'm just going to let Corey talk about that. It's Not up super on that game. It's so cool. It's two metals that have different thermal expansion rates. And if you totally mm -hmm. bond them together, the one expands faster than the other. So like up there in the diagram, there's metal one, metal two, and the two gray bars. And uh, metal one will expand faster, which gets the whole strip to bend away from that side. So it's one of the ways that thermostats work. Um, they used to make thermostats with a bimetallic strip and then a mercury tilt switch inside. They don't do that anymore. But it would it would bend and like make a tilt switch activate based on the the temperature difference or the temperature of the strip. Yeah. Um, so this is, is really actually cool. a very good way of kind of looking at two sides of the same coin. Um, like the engineered flooring here is 
engineered to be stable and the the bimetallic strip is engineered to move in a very specific way by the combination of the materials used yep. okay moving on all right so we're going to talk a little bit about how to make a stuff <laughs> and the different methods so a wet layup is um, probably one of the more direct ways to create composites and you're basically just you know laying the the resin and whatever else you may be using down on a surface and that's what you're doing that's it you you um will build potentially build up layers um it can be reinforced or not boat building is sort of like the quintessential um way that this is used uh for uh, not only building boats from scratch but also ongoing repairs um also you can see here um auto body repairs things like that where you're just kind of laying it onto a surface where it bonds um when there's many many very cool ways to do this and when we get into the mold making se section there is kind of a, a a category of molds known as layup molds that are kind of using the same approach where you're applying the material to a surface in layers right um yeah, like mo boats and uh, you know other like sea going or like water going vessels, anything like that, um, they're going to get this transparent fiberglass because it is completely unconcerned with moisture. Um, and there are many extremely nice epoxies that are made specifically for this pur purpose. Like down here, there's the West Marine stuff. That stuff is really great. It tends to be pricey, but it's very very high quality um things like uh you know automotive bodies uh, this is your good old bondo and other things that you're using just to put in place then they do their job where you apply them and that's it um and then there's sort of like an art there's an art to making surfboards paddle boards um even um skateboards things like that where you want like a continuous smooth but very very strong surface sometimes with a little flex to it um, and I highly recommend people go online and look at um, some, you know, time lapses of people making surfboards because it's really fascinating. And there are techniques that actually transfer from that into things that you'd never guess, such as um, how um, like certain prosthetics are made for humans, things like that. It's very, very cool. Um, and then you know, right here, as far as like, you know, good old classic version of that is, you know, laying a deck and screeding out your concrete. Um, there's, you know, just kind of infinite ways to apply goo to any surface. <laughs> and uh, this is the wet layup technique is kind of, um, you know, the, the umbrella over all of that. Okay and on to vacuum bagging now i do believe we have this planned as an option for this week. yeah we got all the stuff this is this is the thing that we want to do we want to do a wet layup and vacuum bag and that's the example that i made last year that i left in the main space of the of make haven i can go grab it but this is this is exactly what we're gonna do to to try and practice this skill. We'll do a wet layup into a vacuum bagging. This is what we'll do on Thursday, and then we'll repeat again on Sunday in case somebody can't make it. Great. Um, so like I was mentioning before, ep epoxy and fabric layups are incredibly strong, and they're also very, very rigid. So when you need something to be thin, lightweight, and just not move, it's a great, um, it's a great option. And they can be incredibly impact resistant as well. Um, so the normal air pressure is about 14.7 psi. It's, I'll just kind of call that a you know normal atmosphere. And over a large area, um, it it's able to hold the composite in place while the material sets. Um, these guys are envelopes. This is a custom envelope made here you can see the the gasket here where the the two pieces are joined 
Um, and generally you will find if you're doing anything that's an unusual shape, you're going to be making your own bags, basically just by sandwiching plastic together. That, that's a typical way to do it. Um, and there's a lot of prep work that needs to go into any technique that's this one or any like it, because you have many scenarios where you can inadvertently create just a sandwich together kind of mess that will not come apart the way you want it to or alternately if you're if you don't you know take the time to really prepare you may um, spring an air leak which means the vacuum won't hold and it you know kind of negates the entire process so with situations like this, the way that you do it is you lay it out, you you run through it, like make sure that everything is in place and that you have everything where it needs to be before you start mixing your epoxy. Because once um, once the timer is ticking, every every resin has a pot life. Once the timer is ticking, your mind just sort of goes into this state of you know it just ejects information that you knew five seconds previously it's just something it's kind of human nature and if you are rushing and trying to do things that you forgot to do in the setup stage you end up making mistakes and you don't want to ruin a project simply because you didn't take the time to kind of do a dry run first um so you know like be be aware of what you need, make yourself list, do whatever you need to do to be organized about it, and you will not have problems. All right. Um, so the examples here, these are all bad. Yes, these are all bad. Um, they require planning. And um, one thing to note when you're using any fabric or mat or anything like that, the level of flexibility between different materials varies widely and if you've ever worked with, with um, any kind of cloth there are certain cloths that will conform to a shape and others that won't and frequently like for instance with kevlar it doesn't um like it'll bend kind of in one direction more like a thin sheet of plastic it, it's not great about having any kind of a bias it'll allow it to you know conform to other shapes so you need to cut it and kind of fit it to your piece beforehand in order to get a good thing or a good um, lamination. And um, if you don't do that, you know, it's not necessarily the end of the world, but frequently what you'll have to have is um, because of the stiffness of the material, it simply will not lay down and compress. And so you'll end up with a gap um, in between layers. Uh, it won't, it, you know, it won't necessarily make the piece not viable or anything. It just won't be like that complete, like perfect um, sandwich all the way through. Um, <laughs> back to that whole preparation thing, okay. With vacuum bagging, there are a lot of different materials and a lot of different components. Um, it's like, if you've ever, when you look at a picture frame and if you've never built one you don't realize how much goes into it if you build one from scratch you realize like how many parts there are to something that looks relatively simple um and the way this works is you always have to have a base and the base is oops, dang it sorry backing up i swear to God. oh did i go the, the wrong way piece. yeah oh my God. you're going the wrong way Sorry, guys. All good. I, I have in the room. So like in the room with us is yeah. one of those examples that was there. I think oh, go yeah. back to yeah, one or two more. But the, I've got the example and I'm going to leave it here so we can. Oh, like, is look that, at that's it the and, very one? It's the very one. Uh, it's two dress shirts that are <laughs> that are composited together. This was for the robot bartender. And I was trying to make it into something. And I marked on it where it's two layers thick, three layers thick, and four layers thick. And like two layers of shirt with epoxy is pretty bendy. Three layers, you start to lose the bendy and four layers is like, it's a rock. So it's pretty neat. But it's to not see. that much, like when you're holding it, it's really, it's not that much thicker. It doesn't feel that much thicker. Yeah, you really can't tell until all of a sudden you're like, oh, I cannot bend this at all. Yeah, and that's simply because you keep adding fibers 
to it um and they they keep adding <laughs> adding to the mix yep. um okay this time i'm gonna yes i'm gonna not hit my mouse accidentally this time okay um there's really there's a couple of things first of all the the surface that you are uh, this is called it's calling it the tool surface here but the surface that you're um you know building this on it it doesn't have to be the bottom of the bag though frequently you'll have a two-sided bag it needs to not it needs to be non-porous this is very important because otherwise it's just going to take air up through it um and it needs to be stable because if you for whatever reason build something on a certain like any kind of mold or endeavor of this type if you build on a surface that can flex it will pop all of your seals off <laughs> like lots of stuff can go wrong so you need to make sure that you have stability at the base you can't build on top of something that's not stable okay it's a very important feature if you are building with um the bottom being like the second part of the bag and you create a perfect seal where there's a top part of the bag and the bottom part of the bag that's perfect if you are not, however, and there's just the bag, the plastic on top, you have to make sure that that base is non-porous and not flexible, okay? Um, so you'll see here where there's sealant and the like flash tape here, these are creating seals. So that's between the, the bag itself and whatever you're building on, your, uh, your tool surface or the bottom of the bag. Um, you want to make sure that the vacuum connector that's going to be extracting the air is not, it, it's kind of, it needs to be sort of off to the side where it's not going to interfere with the piece itself. Okay. And this is another very um, kind of general thing that you'll see anytime there's an, either an air intake or release or anything, you want it kind of away from the part as much as you can manage. All right. This gray layer here is uh the breather bleeder layer and basically what it, it's kind of like um a spongy it sort of reminds me of like a thin batting used in quilting where it's sort of like a a spongy layer of cloth and what it does is it allows the vacuum it, it allows air to pass through it very very evenly so that the vacuum is maintained over the um the expanse of the of the piece all right does that make sense to everyone i hope I don't know if you want to yeah. elaborate on any of this core no, answer. It's like um, it's totally the batting that you'd fill up a quilt with. And yeah. I think that it lets the air, the vacuum suck through. And it also is the place that your extra epoxy goes. Yep. So like I have one that's here in the room and it's totally soaked with epoxy. And then when it's not soaked with epoxy, it's told it's just like a quilt, quilt batting for a little bit of extra thickness. Yes. And so that leads me to my next important point here. Um see the, the green layer here the peel ply or perforated release film all of that epoxy is super adhesive and it is being vacuumed into every little pore and undercut and possible little microscopic bit if you don't have a way to peel this apart meaning a release then you're going to have just sort of a una lump of you know um bleeder bag the piece you're working on maybe the molds like you have to have a release in between your part and everything else and that is a critical critical phase like i'm always really paranoid and i go back and double check any release agent of any variety that i have because it is the the number one reason that you have trouble with stuff like this the the plastic that we have for later this week is actually in the same chemical category as the Teflon on a, like a fry pan. So it's it's exactly the same fluorine based material that basically nothing will stick to. Yeah. And so that's that's how um, it works. Yeah, epoxy just it, it just wants to stick to everything. It's it's its nature. That's why we love it. But you got to account for it. OK um so then <laughs> in between all this is the piece that is the the uh um, resin plus you know whatever your mat or whatever you've got in there it could be you know kevlar or carbon fiber or what have you um and then below it 
another layer of release film, which keeps it from sticking to the mold. Okay. Um, so it's like a sandwich where you're going to have a release uh, uh, film in this case, or a release agent on each side of your piece, and then everything else built out on either side of that. Okay. So always like, that's like the, those release films are like the bread to your PBJ and the PBJ is the piece that you're making. Okay. Um, so when the vacuum kicks off, it just removes all of the air nice and evenly, thanks to the bleeder, okay? It makes an even surface, as long as you were careful and you laid it out properly, you don't want wrinkles because that leaves a gap where air can be trapped. Um, and the, the bleeder allows like a very, very even, um, nice, smooth, like overall pressure, okay? Um, and then when you have removed all the air, I mean, I don't know, with Corey, did you leave the, uh, did you leave the vacuum on or did you just cut it and, and set it? Uh, it? It totally depends on the quality of the seal that you get. The odds that we're going to need to leave the pump on is pretty high. If you get a perfect seal in your vacuum bag, in theory, you can pump out all the air and then leave it, but that's pretty much never how it's worked for us. So we just leave it for the minimum number of hours to hit like half the pot life and then we can walk away and like turn it on. Yeah. And it'll be fine. Or half half the like cure time. So yeah. we'll, we'll like on Thursday we'd start our thing and then we'd let the pump run until Friday midday, Friday lunchtime. That's the game plan. Okay, we do have more vacuum pump oil, right? Note to self. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I've I'm seen it. That. Okay. Um so it, it it's it's a lot of preparation, but then once it's going, it just kind of goes, and you just wait for it. So, um, I, did I miss anything? I think it's no, no, it's okay. totally just like a hurry up, fifteen like an hour of absolute fury madness, and then like and then you just wait and yeah. hope that it worked. And if it didn't, it's okay because you know you learned something. Yeah, um, absolutely. There is a super awesome video. I don't know that we want to, are we going to do this entire thing now or do you want people to watch uh, No, we, we like... can like, these have been shared. So if people want to watch this, but sometimes I'll like press play and then talk over it if it's not making noise. Okay. Um, I will see if I can do it without it being, oh, no, oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Nice graphics. Okay. So um, this is a very cool video where um, the guy is going to show how they make these very specific parts. And the mold that he's got here looks to be some sort of gypsum or other plaster-like substance um, that makes the form. And the pieces, he's got a couple different types, but the essential thing is it's a very, very um, thin piece that's made using a very small amount of epoxy. You actually really don't need very much. They, uh, I thought it was interesting. The weight of epoxy that they needed for this piece was the same weight as the material, the Kevlar. So that's kind of a good way to, you know, to double check. Now, huh, mold release, look at that. Okay, very, very important. Um, they appear to have a, like a rubbery kind of a finish on this that is probably somewhat flexible in a release by itself. They're also adding, I think, four layers of wax onto this. Um, it's a very serious, yeah. serious endeavor. They take it seriously and they get good results. So it's really just patience, you know, wax on, wax I, off. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this example is totally like if you want to make your own custom motorcycle parts. Yeah, basically which, it is. Which is a super niche category, but like someone, yeah. there's going to be a person that really nerds out the right way on yeah. this. Um, but probably not a good first week project is my right. general. Yeah, this this would be the sort of thing because um, partially because and you know he's got his his tape his you know all those different layers right there. Okay, super nice vacuum pump. His little scale for weighing the epoxy. Um, the the thing that I recommend is if you're going to do this and you want to do a fiber based layup. He's actually they used a, a a vacuum cleaner for this to uh, to see how that how it would do, and it actually did pretty well. So this is something you can kind of fudge together at home if you want. Um, but as I was saying, if you're starting out with this, starting with a really flexible fabric like burlap that goes in all directions relatively easily, 
is going to be a little bit easier to kind of start with the, the entire process. This stuff has like no real desire to conform to curves. And so you have to fit it pretty carefully. Um, and I feel like this might be a little frustrating for, you know, somebody who's trying the entire thing for the first time. So burlap yeah. and like large open weave um, fabrics that are kind of, you know, kind to beginners is a great way to get going because you're still going to get an incredibly strong piece. Like, I mean, unless you really need it to stop a bullet. Um, yeah, but like but seven layers of that would actually stop a bullet yeah just yeah. to be clear yeah like um, it, it's we probably don't need to watch all of this i'm totally right. with you but it's just uh, cool. like if you wanted to see the cool. entire process um, this is what yeah, i do recommend for. it and it's just you know you're you're kind of like it doesn't need to be pretty this is another thing like i wanted to get up to this point it does not need to be pretty it just needs to work and avoid wrinkles yeah that's all i got all right. Um, so, oops, on. and this is the part that we're going to do together on Thursday okay. and Sunday. So you won't like have to figure that out on your own. We're going to do it all as a group, and it'll be sort of, it, it'll feel kind of like the bio part where the the trickiest, hardest parts we're going to do all in one room, yelling at each other in excitement and happiness. Um, <laughs> but you know, in a very yeah. active few minutes. Yeah, um, we're going to have. It won't be you know like alarms going off quick because we, we're going to use a slower cure epoxy so you guys will have plenty of working time. Um, but you know it, it kind of gives you something to think about like you know what you want to try. You could make with like a bowl and some fabric and resin you could make yourself a really cool lampshade or just a fruit bowl or something you know because you're going to have a translucent quality to it. You know anything that kind of comes to mind bring it up we'll see if we can do it you know. Um, so the one thing I will say, the epoxy that we are going to be using, I am not positive it is food safe. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. It is or is not? No, I don't think it's food safe. I wouldn't, unless it is specifically designated as such and says it, don't assume that it is. Yeah, I would say it's probably, I would, I would almost certainly say it's not. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of supplies involved and stuff like this, which we will have. <laughs> Um, if you are doing it on your own, uh, you know, it's, it's a good idea to kind of like, you know, hit up, you can always hit me up or Corey later and say, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Is everything good? And we'll help you just to make sure you don't forget anything. But, um, all in all, the important thing to remember, if you do this on your own, get a resin that gives you enough working time. We will talk about, you know, hot life and cure time and things like that a lot more with the, the mold making and casting section but you have two things to consider when you're looking at any resin the first thing is the pot life which is how long you have to work after the two parts hit each other because these are two part systems there's a there's a the resin and then the hardener of the catalyst okay once those go together the clock starts ticking there are some resins like urethanes that can go the, the one we were using the other night, Corey, was what, two and a half minutes? Yeah, um, once, they, once they hit, it's, it's going. Very fast. And then there are others that will take 24 hours or, you know, or you'll have like several hours or, or half an hour at least, you know, that's, that's kind of typical. So don't purchase a res resin without double checking those two factors. How long you have to work with it and how long it takes before you can move it and open it up um the uh which is the cure time okay or also known as the demold time okay um let's see the again this is stuff we're all gonna we're gonna go over in more detail but an, a very important thing to do is make sure that you don't have a mold that is going to mechanically lock your piece around it and grab it like physically, with if you use a release, but the piece um, it has reverse draft angles that um, go underneath your mold, then nothing you you know no amount of release is going to let it let go because it's physically grabbing. Okay, the, um, the like materials that we have to do our composites are some bowls and like tea plates that we found mm -hmm. at a Goodwill. And so it works great as long as yeah. you don't wrap around the bottom of the bowl 
and that is the that's the grab that you'll never get undone then you have to right. like crush the ceramic to get it out yeah you either have to break the mold or you break the part that's yep. kind of how it works um and you know when you're laying you know i i do encourage everyone to take your time laying everything out because you'll end up putting little darts into fabric or you know snipping it so that it lays flat things like that those you know it, it just you, you do what you need to do to get it to get the result that you want um and then very important you don't want the vacuum connector to be you know in the middle of your piece you want it off to the side like in that illustration so that it's not because uh, it will create a mark or it will suck material up into the vacuum pump, which is the absolute last thing that you want. It's a very sad day. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think I went over all this stuff. You you know, just prepare everything and um, double check your vacuum. If you have an, uh, a vacuum pump that requires oil, you always check that beforehand and don't start the project unless you've got enough in there um but you know just practice practice dry fit and then you can start mixing <laughs> okay and then there's the good old-fashioned squish it to death version if you don't have a vacuum and it's flat or flat enough you just put things together and apply pressure like right here this it looks like burlap is being crushed to death between pieces of foam and you can get very good results this way and i'm precisely Last, sure what's going on here but oh the dude was just squeezing it real hard the <laughs> when this slide went up we did not have a press in the metal shop and now we do so it's a totally viable new option that was not there last year for this to, and it really works well because you can it's sort of open you don't have to worry about the vacuum bits you're just squishing it as hard as you possibly can and the extra comes out the sides yep the only thing I would caution is if you're going to do this, make sure whatever the form you're using is can take the pressure. Right, right, like, absolutely. Like, I mean, plaster is great, but you can crush it. <laughs> like, there's a something that you can use for a vacuum might not work as well for this. So, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Now this is super cool. Not we're not going to be doing it, but it's really really cool. Um this is for making like super professional and or gigantic parts i highly recommend taking a look at the slide in greater detail but um what you have here see the a and the b those are the two parts of the resin and they come they are, are sucked in via the black the black brackets here indicate where the vacuum is happening and so it draws the two parts together into a mixing chamber, which then go to the center of the piece and are drawn outward from the center by the vacuum to create a perfectly infused, perfectly even, um, delightfully bubble free resin experience here. So you'll get this very nice shell that's completely filled in no voids no bubbles no nothing it's very cool um this is sort of the, the high-end fancy pants version <laughs> of this process you, I don't know, I, you had commentary Corey. no that's it that's exactly it it's probably never gonna happen at make haven but it's really stinking cool <laughs> i mean you could rig this i suppose you could but yeah. um Typically, we're we're doing the like sort of handmade, fast and dirty version. Yeah. Um, all right. So getting started. If it's if you can get resin into it, you can make a composite out of it. Jeans, old scarves, tablecloths. You can use paper napkins. You can use anything really. Um, so you know, don't feel feel free to be creative. I would encourage you. You can make something. Um, that may, that means something to you or not. Just use a scrap of something just to get used to the uh, the technique. Um, it's really fun, and I'm looking forward to it. So, <laughs> one of the one of the things that was neat is last year, since we're making you know like a a soup bowl is about the right ballpark for size. Some of the people last year brought in swaths of fabric that like had a design that they wanted to make. It doesn't always work super well. Like don't don't guarantee yourself this is going to work on the first try 
but you can do some really cool stuff with fabric that you like. I really like those bowls that they have there. Mm -hmm. um, those don't look like they've, they probably are starched, not really properly epoxied um, with that particular look. The ones on the left look like they definitely have epoxy in them um, or some sort of a wax, but you can get some really cool stuff to happen. Uh, I also love micarta, which is epoxy and paper. And that turns into like a, a wood-like material. So you can make a hammer out of paper if you're really into that. There's, yeah, there you go. There's all sorts of cool things that you can do to, to make stuff. And so- Like paper mache crafts 2.0. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is the last slide, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna I stop so. sharing. You guys have been so very patient with me. Oh, you, that was that was delightful, Julia. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, which which thank you, Julia, for <laughs> doing the main presentation. Now we're we're at one of the other exciting parts of the foundations class, which is to go through for show and tell and say what weird things we've been up to for the week. It, we have been doing outputs, but there's zero percent reason why you needed to have been doing outputs. You might have been doing other cool things. You could have been you could have been pouring epoxy and getting ready for this. You could have been uh, who who knows what people are up to. So Making it's fun snails. to show and tell. You never know. What, yeah. Making snails, you know. Yeah, I you could you, you could have totally <laughs> been making snails. I don't know who would do that. <laughs> uh, I see a chat. I might have missed it because I had to step away. But are there examples of what we are doing this week? Yes. Yeah, Corey it was that last husband. that last slide with the bowls. We're basically going to be making bowls, and so if you have a fabric, we're going to put it on the back side of the bowl, and you'll brush the fabric with epoxy, sort of like you saw for that that um, bike, the motorcycle parts. And so you'll just take fabric, brush on epoxy, and then we'll all do that at the same time. So if there's five people there, there'll be five bowls made, and then we're going to put it all into one vacuum bag so that we all are doing one vacuum use for the group of us. And then we, we get to go from there to see to see what's happening. Should the fabric be two-sided so it looks the same on both sides? You know how sometimes it's banked on one side and it's straight on the other? That's a good question. And the short answer is everything turns translucent with the epoxy. So like kind of doesn't matter. Also hard to make that work in your favor. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the question. What was it? Oh, should you try and get two-sided fabric so that it looks good? Um, on both sides. If you imagine that that fabric is paper and then you dip it in oil, yeah. that is the effect you're going to get. So you're going to see both patterns simultaneously when light passes through it. And I think the other piece is that it's going to be hard to get one layer of fabric to give you exactly what you want for a look. Um, not impossible, but... You mean you use two layers? My the thing that I have right here is is two and here I can put it on screen, but this is two different dress shirts. There's a blue checkered dress shirt and then there's like a linen shirt that's here, and it with just one layer like it would have been real floppy. Um, so getting something that feels like a bowl, uh, we're sure you can. We're in the midst of class. Sorry, uh, it's real floppy if you do just one. So we're trying to do multiple layers to get it to work out in the I right love way. the thought of you having that on display, like where your other shirts can see it, just sort of as like a, a threat of what happens yeah. if they don't perform. Yep. If you don't, if you don't do a good job, this is what you turn into. <laughs> no, but these are like the dart and things that we're mm -hmm. talking about to get yep. it to like flat. So in here I had to make certain cuts to get the shape to sort of work. And when you get to see this in person, you'll see that it's, it's not perfect by any stretch, um, but this is a good example of how your pieces will come together sort of to make it work a little bit. And then I've got it labeled for layer thickness and, and some of that. Mm -hmm. It'll be hard to make it. I, I will be very impressed when someone gets it just right. Mm -hmm. I can imagine like having one design layer and then a couple sort of neutral layers for strength. Like if you have a white fabric that's basically going to just turn transparent. And then one that's got like one of those scarves that you've made as a design on top of a couple of white layers, I think could work. But you've got to really balance that for how you structure it. 
can we bring in fabric for the in person? Absolutely, totally. If you want to bring in your own fabric, you should totally do it. And how how big should we um like or, bring? Or the remnants? You can be. I mean, the the plate. If it's you know twelve inches square, that'll be more than enough for one decorative layer. And then go to the scrap bin for like a backer a backer layer or two. Okay. Would denim work? I have some old jeans that. Denim totally work. Yeah. Okay. And then somebody last year did denim and they added in wood veneer also. And it looked really oh. weird and cool uh, because it will totally penetrate into the veneer. And then it was like wood and denim all in one bowl. So it was pretty fun. Oh yeah, you can definitely patch together fabrics for sure. Yes. Let's see. Cool. Okay. So veneer cool. type could work, different fabrics. Is there any other type of like thin? material you probably that, just want something that has a porosity to it so woven fabric is great okay if you yeah. did something like vinyl it doesn't uh, have any kind of like it won't absorb the resin to really really work the way that we're intending so you just need something with some variety of a, a porosity or a weave texture cool yeah okay. and, I, and i think paper would probably be another way that it could be a bad choice because paper would just kind of mush under the resin, like it, it wouldn't, when you do micarta, you've got to be deliberate in how you apply the thing. You don't want to like mush it. You could mush sort of like when paper gets wet. If you're, you know, if it's the term paper that you wrote and you're really upset that it got a, a drop on it, you can hold it just right and it'll dry out fine. Um, or it can turn into just mush. And so I think paper is probably another one that's a risky choice for this. It would have but, to be the right paper, which means you would have had to do tests. So I think that might be not for this week, but for later. Yeah. What about like a layer of fabric and a layer of lace? Have you know hefty lace? Oh, a layer of fabric and a layer of lace. That'd one hundred percent work. Yep, absolutely. And lace will actually be really good because it'll conform to kind of anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting like quandary of what you want to bring in and try and make a bowl from. You got to not imagine that your first one's going to be perfect. So don't bring like grandma's favorite, you know, like not that, but um, something that's like a point in the right direction. If you know, if you can imagine some weird case that you want in the future, it's good to head in that direction with the tests. So, yeah, but that's, that's what we up to, but show and tell we should, we should talk about what people have been up to uh, in the room. We've got, well, Julia, would you like to show and tell? Have you done any weird things this week? Oh, uh, yeah. So what do I got here? Um, <laughs> you don't have to. Do you need to go get something? Week, this week, I mean, all I've got are my my usual like heads, you know, hanging out. I did. I didn't do it this week, but I did do a three D print of one of my my sculptures, which I was pretty excited about. I scanned it and shrunk it and made this little guy. So but that's it's not really pertinent to the, you know, what you guys are doing, but it was fun for me. Yeah, no, that's super fun. And I will be molding that and casting it into wax so that I can detail it by hand. Yeah. Cool. Very awesome. counterintuitive. <laughs> All right, we've we um, the people who are remote. If you would like to show and tell, just open up your cameras. Um, but in the room, we've got Vincent, who's right behind me. And have you been doing any fun things? Any cool stuff you've been up to? I'm carrying them from the from the car to the new apartment. <laughs> That's yeah. I moved recently. Still um, unpacking and stuff. Assembled most of the furniture. Um, and then just made some little things here and there just as needed. Like um, I didn't have a place to put dishwasher tablets. So I laser cut um, like a sliding matchbox type thing to fit, the, oh, fit those. That's smart. Uh, 3D printed um, headphone mount um, for work from home. Um, didn't get to do enough with, with like inputs and outputs, uh, unfortunately. Um, I am going to get some smart plugs sometime soon. Uh, mm -hmm. that I want to, to play around with flashing a custom firmware on it. So that way I'd be able to 
to um, talk to my phone and say, hey, turn on the lights before I get home, stuff like that. Yeah, that's cool. Also, I um, just recently started playing with some of the home assistant stuff. That's what I would want. Yeah, do. which is really cool. And it works unbelievably well if you're comfortable in Linux, and I know you totally are. And so it's it's a really cool platform to play around with. And then you can really extend it with ESP8266 and ESP32. So you can do a ton of cool stuff with that to build your own like custom sensors and, and crazy stuff. Yeah, like I have some smart home stuff already, mm -hmm. but I have to install this app from this company, that app from that company, and they don't always you know, work smoothly. Oh yeah. But using something like Home Assistant, still in one system. Oh yeah, solves that problem, which is incredible. So that's fun. That's that's a lot that you've been up to. Moving is a big is a big task. Yeah. And I I have some questions um for afterwards for you too because yeah. I have some missing furniture parts that I need to clone. Oh, well that's fun. Yeah. yeah. Can totally work on that. Uh, awesome. Let's see. Next up, Norm, your camera is on. Does that mean that you'd like to go next? Um, yeah, just, just to report that I did Corey's exercises, the sketches and outputs, and I confirmed that it is really true that the sketch with Mario's um, theme plays that. Although looking at how intricate the, the programming of it is for every note, I can't imagine myself ever doing it. So instead, I took the 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 sketch for fading a, an LED, and I just changed the connection so that it was the speaker, and it creates this weird warbling kind of danger sound, which was kind of cool, um, and more within my capacities anyway than than doing all those notes were. So that's what I did. That's that's tons of fun. And those like I have not programmed those notes either. That's so much work for somebody to get. But it does feel like a task that like once you figure out how to make two or three notes, it probably extends. Um, there's but yeah, that's fun. Well, I, I was thinking if I could connect your potentiometer or the encoder in between there, I didn't get around to this. I, I could I could make change the, the warbling danger thing to to something more intricate you know without programming it out all in advance yeah there's there's some really cool and it's i'll send the word in the chat because it's hard to spell um but a theremin is a really fun light-based instrument that like it sounds like it makes like a voice. Halloween noise yeah like what the 80s thought the future was going to be um that's what it sounds like and so it's a it's fun and weird, and they like make them and play them in Big Bang Theory and other very nerdy venues. Um, Star Trek definitely had them at some point in there, I think. But but it's like wave your hands in front of a few light sensors, and it's an instrument. So it's lots of fun. Um, next up, Lisa's got a bunch of cool stuff. Do you want to try and share? I've got a, a camera that we can point at you or at your at your things. We're gonna cut and adjust so we can play with the setup here. So I finished it and brought it in simply because those that were here could feel it. It feels really good. So it's nice and smooth now and continuous. And it's finished. All of the cut areas here were not continuous before, and it took a lot of hand sanding. sanding. Um, and I put that wax, the beeswax slash mineral oil that you can buy in the back. Yeah. So far, two coats. I don't know whether that's it or. She was probably plenty. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. Wow. I'm glad it's done. It does feel buttery smooth. <laughs> And uh, here, I'll put this down on your. Try to. Yeah, we'll sort of put it in here. You lay them down, I'll find the thing. Oh, wow. oh, did you make this with a bunch? Yeah, that's what I did with the dye that I made from the water jet that um, I punched the pieces out in a hydraulic press and then soldered 
soldered the beads together, you know, the two halves together. And then um, I made these jump rings. This this material, this metal in between is, it is sterling silver, but it's called argentium. Mm -hmm. So it's a slightly different alloy. And the benefit of it is it doesn't tarnish like sterling silver does. And another benefit is you can, um, instead of soldering the rings closed, you can fuse them closed. So you never oh, see wow. any joint. And it, uh, so it's a ring that I soldered to a straight piece and I drilled holes in the sides of the beads and shoved it in and then soldered it on with a lot of steps. And then um, each one of these beads I handled differently. So there'd be a little interest involved. Some of them have a patina. And then I rubbed Renaissance wax on the top so that it would seal the areas that have been patinaed. And on the underside, I sprayed an acrylic spray so that the copper wouldn't rub off on skin because copper does that. And then these were jump rings that I made out of Argentium. And then I made these, uh, the catch, the, the clasp, sorry. Yeah, so I uh, the hook and the, the ring that the hook goes into, I made to mimic the shape of the flower. So oh, that's it. And then lastly, um, I've got this problematic cabinet in my kitchen. That's an antique uh, hut, kind of hutch. And it's been progressively falling apart. And initially I thought it was infested with a beetle called woodworm. And oh. then I was ready to literally put a sledgehammer to it last week because I wasn't going to deal with, you know, horrible chemicals. But then I took a step back and I, I did a little breathing over it. I said, maybe it isn't that. The reason why I thought it was that is because there's a pile of sawdust accumulating all the time in there. Uh -huh. And so, uh, but then I said, but there's no exit holes. And if, if it had been those bugs, there would be exit holes. So I said, well, what's causing the sawdust? Then I realized it's because the drawer supports had completely fallen out and disappeared. Oh. And the drawers, when I would pull them in and out, were stressing and, and rubbing. Uh -huh. So I spent after that this week creating draw supports. And that's what this is going to be. I'm going to cut it, uh -huh. pull it into the side. I The central draw support exists. It had fallen into the bottom of the cabinet. I didn't even know. So I glued that in. And when I put these on the sides, and then, so then I don't want still the drawers pulling in and out are going to rub still, right? Because it's wood against wood. So I, I thought to myself, what can I put on the underside of the drawer glides, which are wood, yeah. that will glide well? And I've decided it's either nylon or Teflon. Sure. And I did my research about what I could get, what I could afford. And I decided there's Teflon tape that's Teflon fabric on one side that's silicone adhesive on the other. Mm -hmm. huh. And I'm sticking that on the other side. Hope it works. Yeah, that sounds like as good a solution as any. Yeah. The like wood on wood hardware is always fascinating and yeah. a, feels tenuous at right. best. Um, but nice if you got a solution. So. so I hope it's yeah. We'll know next week. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and then let's see, Arvia, are you around? And what have you? You were. Traveling? Are you were you, are you back? Um, no, I'm still at my mom's. I was supposed to leave tomorrow, but I changed my ticket to leave Thursday. Um, so I haven't really done anything but work and spend time with them. But uh, nice. who did you help lay the floor? <laughs> <laughs> we did not do that yet. We went and got the um the oh gosh, I can't remember what it's called. Basically, like the border. Of where the floor meets the wall. The oh, the trim, floor. yeah. The trim um, the other day, but we didn't we didn't do it yet. But <laughs> I'm watching a lot of Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know? But yeah. It's all right. Sometimes it's good to just relax and be with family. Like I was just I was just reflecting on that this this week that I look forward to that at some time in the near future. If I can get myself back to Ohio. Which I'll figure out a way. <laughs> I drive. Yeah, gotta drive. So <laughs> sounds sounds like you've been having fun. Uh, say hi to the fam for us. And uh, yeah, when you come back, we'll be ready to do composites if you're coming back on Thursday. 
for sure. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to, well, I, honestly, that's probably the only reason I'm coming back is to, <laughs> to do class. Um, but yeah, I, I'm excited about composites. Yeah, we're going to do, so just to go through logistics, that's an important detail. We'll do a Thursday session and that feels like a 6.30, 7, something like that, 6.30 or 7. We'll have to all, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, Julia, is there a time that is better for you between 6.30 and 7? I was, um, I was planning on getting there a little earlier. My, my normal hours are 6 to 9, so I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I'll get there probably around 5.30 for the mandatory milling around phase yeah. and then um, the one thing i would say it it will pay to kind of consider what you want to do ahead of time and at least show up with an idea yeah i i, I would agree i think like i'm going to get here at about 5 30 on thursday also is when i'll arrive but i think that an hour to an hour and a half of just pondering what you want to do feels very appropriate. And then I think actually mixing the epoxy somewhere in the 6.30 to 7 window feels right because we have an hour of pot time that puts us at like 8 p.m. for being of like having to sort of walk away from it. And so that feels like the right timeline just to get it going that somewhere in that 6.30 to 7 we'll try and mix the first epoxy. Um, and it, it kind of means that if you're going to be here for the Thursday session, that's you need to be here by then. Um, and then we'll do it again on Sunday, Sunday afternoon, somewhere more in the like four to five time range. Uh, maybe we'll shoot for 4.30 to five to get that one started so that it, we can get it done and then everyone can get, wash their hands and go have dinner um, at home or together or whatever. But that gives us another round. And Julie and I will both be there for Thursday and then Sunday. It may- I will, I will also attempt to be there. I just have to double check oh. for conflicts. Yeah, no worries, but I will be there for sure. So one way or the other, we'll have two sessions to do this. So if you wanted to, if either one works for you, or if you're really gung ho and you want to do both, I suppose there's not a reason why you can't. Um, so there's that's the the general game plan is to try and make sure that this this runs and that it's very exciting. It is. I will say it's a big fun bonding moment because everyone's all stressed at the exact same time about the exact same thing, and so it's. And that said, it's a fun, happy stress, but it's like a timer is running fun stress. So it's a it's a good one to come for. It's a good group bonding activity um, and definitely fun. So that is the plan done for the week. Sounds cool. Good. All right. Uh, good to see everybody oh and what i have been up to i should probably maybe i should share oh yeah how did it turn out it it oh. turned out great so let okay. me pull up i'm gonna open up some pictures and then share my screen once once i get to the the right reasonable photos okay cool and so okay. doo, 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 Duh, doo. that's what i was doing this week <laughs> yeah okay so sharing screen share screen here we go um this is what it currently looks like and so this is the side of the stand where we did an epoxy pour. We uh, Julia and Ruby painted the back side of that red where it was recessed. So here's what it looks like just painted. And so that's the, the general look from just the paint. And then we poured epoxy in. It's the epoxy mite 100. And we added a red tint that is definitely only orange. Um, and then, oh, it looks like my internet might have crapped out. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully not. But um, in here, that's the color. Here's, we degassed the epoxy, which was fun. And then that's the, the logo. And then here's the dream team that was working on it. <laughs> uh, we went to go get, um, we went to go get uh, ramen and bubble tea. This is what it looked like before when there was no paint applied and the structure is sort of built. There's dowels to hold the top fence together. Things are coming along. And so it's definitely headed in in a fun direction. Also, I made crepes uh, and stuff over the weekend. So there was lots of fun to be had across crepes the board. And little uh, Lego guys. Yeah, and, and little Lego guys and all that sort of stuff. And then I made apple skeevers. I was really on a breakfast food trip this weekend. That was That was the game. 
Uh, and so here's like the structure along with the model that has been disassembled in polyurethane. So this does not exist in the space right now. It's disassembled completely. And once we get all the, one of the things about having composites is that you're gonna have leftover epoxy. That's what these little Lego people are. They're, they're tests in this case, but it's good to have a spare mold around to have something to do with leftovers. The, um, the epoxy pour that we have going right now is you can see it's concave. We're gonna take all of our spare epoxy and put it over the top to make it so that it's convex and then we'll sand it back down so that it's flat. So, because we'll just be clear epoxy, we're not gonna color it. So it'll, it'll be a nice add on to this and it'll give us some place to put it over the, the two days of, of doing it. So we're not wasting, we're trying to make good use of it. Um, so that, that is what I have been up to this week, which is lots of fun. And it ties into what we're gonna be doing. Here's vacuum forming, which is a fun like extension of all of this. And then at some point I'm going to go through and edit together all of the, all of the content of like how we built this so that you can go from idea to design phase to thing because like it exists in a digital world with a, a fully digital plan for how this would get made. And then we have taken it all the way to reality, which is fun and exciting. And this is a good example of what a final project or a make a, a very high end make something big project could be um, if you really wanted to go all, all out. And then here's like, this is what it was um, before. You can see the sort of sort of shaky stand that it was on. This is this is why we needed to make a new stand for the thing. <laughs> so that's the that's the That'll sort of summary. be the black and white like infomercial like oh no like segment yeah. you know where there's yep. always a, and you have Wobbly. to put your hands up and cry. Yeah, and I think a member made that coffee table, so I don't want to like decry it too much. It's just in a public space and lived a full life. So, and it's a very nice, like delicate coffee table. I don't think it's, it was intended for this use. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of weight. It's asking that a lot. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So, yeah. Um, so that's what, oh, I need to figure out how to stop sharing. But that is the, the overall attitude of what we've been up to for, for me this past week. And then hopefully we'll have lots of other cool things that we made by the time we get to the end. So that is it, everybody. Uh, thanks for meeting up with us. And then on third, I'm going to send out a message with exact times to the foundations channel for when we're going to get together for Thursday and Sunday. You can come for either and we'll do our composites then. So sounds great. Uh, thank you, Julia, for doing the majority of the talk. Nice seeing everyone. Yeah. And now I have a great big new monitor I have to set up. So I hope Ooh, very nice. Enjoy. Yes, very exciting. Um, good night, all. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night.